years ago. This psalm became one of my favorites, along with its sister psalm, psalms, Psalm 73 and Psalm 49. They all teach the same thing. Um, psalm 37 is the longest. And I've taught all those psalms, and I've taught Psalm 37, but we're going to go a little slow this time. For my enjoyment, I hope, and for yours as well, because I think it's very, very worthwhile to do that in this psalm. There's 40 verses, but we're not really going to get past 10 or 11 of them tonight. And I have to say that I've often, often turned to this psalm for counseling. Um, pastors have to have some places to go when people come to them and need their counsel. And there's some places that are get well-worn because they're very, very important. And David wrote this psalm, and David, the theocratic king, had pastoral responsibilities. I can put it that way, for the whole nation. He was the shepherd, right? The king is a name for the shepherd, but uh, he certainly had to protect the theocracy from enemies from without, but also minister to the needs, feed the sheep, and uh, even protect the theocracy from enemies from within, which are always much more dangerous. A wolf in sheep's clothing is a lot more dangerous than a wolf without sheep's clothing. And we've got plenty of those. And it's obvious that this psalm, although it's 3,000 years old, is never going to go out of date till Jesus comes. Um, I hope you read it. Uh, we're not going to read the whole psalm. I'm just going to go to the first 11 verses, and we'll get started. And I want to make some initial observations. But when we read these first 11 verses, I believe that you will get an a idea of how very practical this psalm is. Hope you put it in your. Um, I, I hope you put it in your, uh, uh, just like the doctors had medical bags they'd take to houses. I hope you put this in your, your 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 medical, spiritually spiritual medical chest, and know how to get it out when needed. Psalm 37, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall be cut down like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he'll give thee the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he'll bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. This is important. <clears throat> Sometimes... Even God's people can get jealous of other people who legitimately, legitimately excel in them in life. But these men are, these men are shady. These are wicked people. They excel because of wickedness. <clears throat> they get ahead by cheating. They get ahead by uh, doing wrong, and so. That's a special temptation to God's people when some people they know are obviously evil are getting ahead, not just of them, but even the fact that they are getting ahead rather than being dealt with by God. And so verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, fret not thyself because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. And that might be angry at God, anger at God, or angry at the other person that's getting ahead by doing wicked ways. Forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any way to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off. Now verse 8 and verse 9, very close. 
Fret not thyself in any way to do evil. In other words, there's a temptation to join the evildoers. Everybody else is getting ahead by doing this. They're cutting corners. They're doing wrong. So maybe that's the way life ought to be lived. So I'm going to, I'm going to follow their example. See how verse 8 and verse 9 go together. Fret not yourself, yourself in any way to do evil. Don't be like them. For evildoers shall be cut off. Those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. And that is a wonderful place in the scriptures. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be not but be. For thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it will not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Father, help me to speak. Help each of us to hear your truth tonight. Amen. Now, we know that not all people who are successful financially are wicked. Many people get their wealth in a proper way. They've succeeded by hard work. They simply work harder and smarter than other people. And we certainly shouldn't begrudge them that success. They're wise. They have wise business practices, prudent investments. And we could give many examples, couldn't we, of wealthy people who are honest, hardworking, philanthropic, and charitable, and wonderfully saved, wonderfully saved. And it's not difficult to document people in the Old Testament who were wealthy, but uh, hardworking, prudent, and got ahead because of God's blessing on their life. Job, Abraham, Joseph, in the Old Testament, Barnabas, Lydia, Philemon, possibly Aquila and Priscilla in the New Testament. And we have the New Testament verses like 1 Timothy 6, 17, and 18 addressed to rich Christians. Uh, it, the Lord didn't say, you're something wrong with you, you're rich. You're something, you're something evil with you because you got more money than everybody else. It simply said, those who command those who are rich in this age not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. That's what it says. But it doesn't say, oh, you got to give away your money or something wrong with you because you made money and you know how to make jobs and make money. And James says in one nine, book of James, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who's rich should take pride in his low position. What's the low position? Well, I'm saved and I fellowship with other people who are not on the same social scale or financial scale as myself. And I, I had to admit my sin and before God, and but the one who's rich should take pride in his low position because he'll pass away like a wild flower. The rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business, even the Christian rich man. Now, I want to make a statement as we think about this. No wealthy person is as wealthy today or wealthier today than he was yesterday. You say, wait a minute, I know about Warren Buffett, I know about Jeff Bezos, I know about, what's the guy that's trying to buy Twitter? I can't think of his name. Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. I know about all those guys. They're wealthier every day. No, they're not. They make more money, but they've got less time. Every day Warren Buffett lives or any of the rest of them, they got one day left that's gone. One less day to live. And time is money. And so they got less time. I hope you just understand my point. And they may not be like the Tennessee Ernie song, the Tennessee Ernie Ford song, another day older and deeper in debt, but they're another day older <laughs> and have less time to be here. So they may be making more, but they have less time to enjoy it. And that's true of all of us. True of all. I got, Linda and I are blessed with more money than we've ever had. Not that we got a lot, but we got some. It's better than having nothing than when we were younger. But we all have, we, we have less time. You have less time. It's just the way life, life is, right? And so having said all that, there are people, 
have, we know there are people who are legitimately less, are legitimately wealthy in one sense, but and godly people, saved people, but they each every person has less time every day that goes by, and so they really have less, even though they might their bank account might be growing. Uh, they're on the clock, but there are other people, and this psalm is about them. The wicked rich, they don't get wealthy because of being industrious or anything like that. They're conniving, they're deceiving, they're hurting others, they're stepping on others to get up the ladder of what they think is success. They're dishonest, they're dangerous. They are the wicked. They are the wicked rich. And the Bible almost makes those synonyms in some Psalms because it's pretty hard to get super wealthy without being dishonest and deceptive. Some people have gotten wealthy, honestly. But we have all kinds of examples that could come to your mind. All right, think about, give me five names of people in the world today that are the wicked rich. I'm not going to name them. I'm not going to dignify them by names. But there's certainly people that we could name. I, I got them written in my notes, but I'm going to tell you they are. That was in my notes, John. <laughs> But he, 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 he comes. How about, well, how about the Black Lives Matter people who've taken money from these corporations and building million-dollar homes? Not one, but several. I'd say those people are wicked. So how about TV preachers? How about the medical profession, insurance companies, and drug companies making money? There's a lot of people that make money off other people's suffering a lot. There's a lot of people make a lot of money helping the poor because it's crooked. They skim it off for themselves. And so the shocking thing is in the Old Testament Jewish theocracy, there were people like that, which means they weren't pagans, they weren't Gentiles, they were Jews. King David, the, the theocratic king, had a group in in the theoc Old Testament theocracy that hated everything he did. They despised it. They were among the wicked rich, and they were fighting against what he was doing. He, it's not like David's enemies were all uncircumcised Philistines. There were some circumcised Jews that were undermining everything he did. One of the great mistakes of the church is to try to make the church into a theocracy. Great mistake in the Middle Ages. Terrible. That's what caused all those European wars. Bad idea. And we should learn from what happened in the Old Testament that this isn't a good way to go. God had a purpose for showing that and showing the weakness of that because the weakness of the Old Testament kingdom was the wickedness of the kings and the wickedness of the people. People weren't, many of them weren't born again, and many of the kings weren't born again. So the awkward, but even when you got a born again king, you like David, you got a saved king, you got plenty of people within the theocracy that don't like the policies. And it was the same thing in Europe, and it's the same thing, it was the same thing in America where they kind of brought the theocratic idea of the, the confusion of kingdom and church to America. And we had churches that were established and making money by the taxes, and it just was not a good thing. The only time that theocracy is going to really work, and God's showing that in the Bible, is when Jesus comes. And God is showing all that, the need for all that. In the battle, King David's describing in this psalm, and really haven't got into that battle totally, is still going on 3,000 years later and will go on till the second coming. How many good churches, good seminaries are now terribly bad? And Satan took them over. I, I just read a seminary, it's United Methodist Seminary. They are now, it's, forget the name of it, they are now teaching their people to pray to the queer God. The queer God. 
Okay. <laughs> How rotten is that? So, as we come to this section, we realize churches get influenced, churches get infiltrated, uh, tares are sown among the wheat, Satan's constantly doing this. David had a whole party that was against everything he was for. Dale Ralph Davis, who I really enjoy, he said the psalm is a sort of is has a sort of obsession with the wicked. The word wicked appears 13 times in this psalm. I wish I'd have read him before I read the psalm and counted them because I counted them all and then I <laughs> and then I read and he he counted them for me 13 times. And James Montgomery Boyce said after a lifetime of reflections on the ways of the righteous and the wicked, we have God's dealing with each. That's what this psalm's about. Now, this psalm, if I can, um, this is just initial observations, was written when David was old. He says so uh, in verse 25. So this psalm was written, he, he says, I have been young, but now I'm old. Uh, and... Uh, I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. That's not just a stylistic device. He was old. And he'd had a lot of experience. And so he wrote this psalm after decades of watching this conflict between the wicked and the righteous. He'd seen it. And... Boyce said this verse, verse 25, establishes the psalm as a psalm of mature wisdom. That's one, of, one observation. Another it is, it's an acrostic. We're back to an acrostic psalm again. Can't see it in English, but it's there. And so it's an impossible psalm to outline. It's not a psalm where there's logical thought or a flowing argument. It's not meant to do that. It's an alphabetical psalm. It's more proverbial repetition. It's meant, an alphabetical psalm is meant for a mnemonic device. When I had to learn the Greek alphabet and Hebrew alphabet, I put it to music and sang it to myself. And so an, an acrostic psalm is an alphabetical psalm, and uh, it's meant as a mnemonic device, and it's also meant, and it's just kind of saying the same thing over and over again. It's not getting too many new thoughts. It's just saying the same things in memorable ways so that they'll stick. It's a good way to teach young people, right? They don't need a discourse. They don't need a theological paper. That's what Proverbs, which are meant to teach young people, they need something um, that can stick in their memory. It can be like a concealed carry gun that when temptation comes, they're ready. So it's like a mouse gun, these proverbs. So they're ready to defend themselves. It's something that can be carried with them. This, 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 uh, the, some of these. Now they may forget many of these verses, but there's some that are going to stick, and those ones that stick will be the ones that they'll have with them when temptation comes. I love the book of Proverbs. I've taught Proverbs, I think, at least twice I know, maybe three times. I love that book. And But again, Proverbs are meant to just stick in your mind and be memorable so that you can pull them out, and especially when you need them in temptation. And so this is what this is all about. These are, this is very proverbial. And so he's not trying to say all that he can say on the problem of good and evil or, or the problem of why the wicked rich. He's just trying to say it in a way that will be memorable sayings that will stick in the memory that can be carried about and used when needed. There's many Proverbs that have helped me, right? I hope that you've got some that have helped you, that have kind of guided your life when you met a decision to make. 
and a proverb popped into your mind. And it helped you make the right decision. Derek Kidner calls this a wisdom song. And Van Gameren said, there's little evidence of logical progression of thought in the song. It's just saying the same thing over and over and over. And basically, the view of the psalm is this. The wicked prosper in the short run, but not the long run. <laughs> and the righteous suffer in the short run and prosper in the long run. That's basically what it's saying, if I can just boil 40 verses down, most of which we haven't even read yet. For 13 years, I used to drive up to New Philadelphia. I've told you this before. It's an old illustration. We were starting a church up there and drove up there. Plus, all oh, for 50 years, I've driven up there to see my parents. So I've had a lot of experience on 77 North between Marietta and New Philadelphia. And I've noticed something through the years, and I've said this before, so forgive me if I say it again that there's an area from New Philadelphia, south of New Philadelphia and north of Cambridge, that in the wintertime, the wind blows in a certain way, can get very dangerous, can get very icy, and you don't even know it. And I did a 180 on that four lane one time. Kind of learned my lesson. It, I didn't go off the road, I just... <laughs> and so... But I noticed at certain times when the weather's bad, and then at Cambridge, the weather always gets better. And I noticed over the years, once I learned that, after I did that 180 and I began to learn to slow down, I didn't get jealous of cars that were going 70 and 80 <laughs> shooting past me when I'm going 50. You know, it's oh, they're real boy. They, got, they must be doing good. They're really making time here. I'm creeping along because often I would find them later, five miles down the road, in the median or in the ditch, and I'm going by. So it was the old tortoise and the hare thing. The wicked rich get ahead, but they get ahead by doing foolish things. And there's, we live in a moral universe, and they're gonna, it's going to catch up with them. So one entitled this psalm, Wise Living in a Crooked Generation. So it's, there's something very proverbial about it. Spurgeon said, evil men, instead of being envied, are to be viewed with horror and aversion. But I'm not in that car. <laughs> they're going to spin out. Glad I'm not in that guy's family or in that guy's business. So another said that the psalm is rather a collection of divine aphorisms on the same subject than a continued and connected discourse. Now, there's no way we're going to get 40 verses, so I'm just going to go through the first part of it because it's so good to me. I hope it'll be good to you. These, these first 10 or 11 verses. King David tells us what not to do, and he tells us what to do. You know, sometimes we parents, we focus on the negative, tell our kids what not to do, but we forget to tell them what to do. <laughs> the psalm doesn't make that mistake. And what not to do is found in verse 1, 7, and 8. Do not fret. Do not Fret. Verse 1, verse 7, verse 8. Fret not. Fret not. Fret not. To fret is to be in a state of anxiety and worry. And worry is a legitimate way of translating this or using this. I've often used this psalm when people are worried about something or anxious about something similar to Philippians 4, and that's legitimate. Boyce preached two messages on this psalm entitled, Not to Worry. And that's legitimate. But the word fret here is a hit pa'el of hara. Hebrew word hara, it means don't be incensed. 
What's it mean to be incensed? Well, we get incense. What do you do with incense? You burn it. If someone is incensed, it means they're burning up with anger. Or hot under the collar. So it is being concerned, worried about something, but it's it it's not just worried. They're mad. <laughs> they're angry. They're angry that life is the way it is. Wait a minute. I thought this was going to be a Psalm 1 life where uh, the by people that follow the Bible are prospering and the wicked are judged. This isn't my life. I'm upset. That's the picture. And so David is saying, don't get inflamed. Don't get angry. Don't blow a cork. Don't have a heart attack over this. By the way, this particular word, ara, is translated here, threat, is used of Cain's anger in chapter 4. I think three times. It's used of Jonah's anger. They were incensed. Now, most of us that are married have made our mate mad. They're upset with us. But I'd have to say, I'd, I've only made Linda incensed a few times. <laughs> Usually, she's just mad. And often not even that, because she's better in that area than I am. I really got to mess up to make her mad, and I've only made her incensed maybe a couple times. Well, maybe more than a couple, <laughs> but not too many. I'm pretty good at making somebody upset. But David says, don't be inflamed. Don't be incensed. Don't be enraged at this situation where the wicked seem to move ahead where you're not, and they're taking advantage of you. It's easy to get incensed on the news, isn't it? I can tell when people watch more news than read their Bible. They're walking around mad. And he said, don't do that. <laughs> Want to have high blood pressure? Just watch too much news. Not the bad things going on. It's the reporters and the bad things that, that how they're reporting it can get you upset. Arno Gaberlein said, thousands upon thousands of Christian believers have turned and still turn to this psalm for comfort and help. So that's what this fret means. You, people say, I'm steamed up. I'm, I'm boiling mad. I'm furious. That's what it, don't do that. So he's describing here a way of life of trust and confidence in the Lord, which, which keeps the heart from fretting and being disturbed because of the wicked in such a way that we might even say, well, I give up. I'm just going to be like them. Then I'll get ahead at least. Peter Craigie, the Hebrew scholar, entitles verse 8, Forget Fury. Just forget it. Uh, the founder of Liberty University, Jerry Falwell, was a semi-fundamentalist. He was a fundamentalist, and he went semi-fundamentalist. He kind of tried to straddle the evangelical fundamental camp. And uh, he had his good points and his bad points. But one thing he said in his Somewhere I got this. A fundamentalist is an evangelical who's mad at something. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I have to give him credit for being funny. And some fundamentalists are mad. They're just angry men. They're just angry people. And that's not a credit to fundamentalism. And I think a lot of people were driven to new evangelicalism because of some of the fundamentalists, not all, were just displaying an anger that was not appropriate. Even though their position was right. Someone said, I agree with their position, but I abhor their spirit. Why can't we have the right position in the right spirit? And I'm not saying there isn't such a thing as righteous anger. There is. And some people who've been uh, upset at fundamentalism don't know enough righteous anger. There is a righteous anger, but 
The problem with righteous anger is it can spoil. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Righteous anger can overnight. We're not to be marshmallows. We're not to be complacent. We're not to be apathetic. We're not to be um, people who can't get upset at wrong. But we got to control that. Or we can become we can become harmful to ourselves and others and not effective. So David's trying to deal with that, and he's he, he he knows he had a problem with this himself. And he realizes how dangerous this is. H.C. Leopold said of what David said in verse 3, when David said, um, trust in the Lord, do good, so shall you dwell in the land, and verily you'll be fed. Leopold said, there are things that a man must leave in the hands of God while he himself performs his normal duties. We're never going to fix it all. We're never going to fix everybody. We're never going to totally fix our churches, no matter how good they are. Spurgeon said, to fret is to worry, to have a heart burning, to fume, to be vexed. And I'm going to show you where David blew it. David held his temper so many times that Nabal really pulled his chain. And David blew up at a wicked rich man, a wicked Jewish man. Saul could try to kill him, throw spears at him, try to hunt him down. He kept he kept his cool. Nabal, you know what he did. After David's men had helped Nabal, he just bad-mouthed them, bad-mouthed them. And David said, I'm going to kill them all. Put your swords on. He just lost it. 1 Samuel 25, 4 to 18. Thank God for Nabal's wife. How a man like that got a wife like her, I don't know. <laughs> And you know, 10 days after David turned, after she talked him from not killing Nabal, Nabal died a miserable death. God took care of the problem. And remember what she said? You're going to be king someday, and you don't want to have this bad memory of what you're about to do. David just about lost his reputation that God had been building from this one fool. So this psalm, I believe, is written out of David's examination of his own heart and how easy it is to lose it. There are people that just pull your chain, right? They can set you off by the way they do things and the way they operate. And that's what this psalm is saying. Uh, watch the word fret. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. It's a major word. Don't be incensed. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they'll soon be cut down like the grass and wither like the green herb. So don't fret. And he says it also again in verse 8. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself in the way. And he says it one more, oh, he says in verse 7, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, fret not yourself. So three times he says, fret not, fret not, fret not. Just circle it if you want to. He says it three times because it's a major exhortation. Don't do it. Don't do it. Major exhortation. My guess is that all during Good Friday, even up to Easter evening, a lot of fretting was going on. Don't, can't prove it. I remember on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and wife said, we hoped he'd been the one who redeemed Israel. Are you, you're the only stranger in Jerusalem didn't know what happened? They were devastated. No doubt there was plenty of fretting against Caiaphas, Pilate, the Sanhedrin, and Judas, and the Romans. 
Now, the resurrection changed all that. <laughs> the resurrection changed all that. And we say, why shouldn't we fret at these people? Well, one, they're as ephemeral as the green grass. Now, our grass lasts a little, you know, pretty longer than theirs, but in that climate, it's here today and gone tomorrow. They have rains in the spring, rains in the fall, and in the summer it stops raining, and then the grass goes brown. And basically, when he says in verse 2, for they'll soon be cut down like grass and wither like a green herb, he's saying they're like grass. They're not going to be here. You, you're, you're getting too worked up about something that's, you, that's going to end up in nothing. And he says in verse 8, Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself in any way to do evil. This is going to cause you to sin if you get into this. You can actually get into sin by fretting against other people's sin, either by following their example or losing your temper in a wrong way and so forth. How many times has my sin provoked someone else's sin? Or someone else's sin provoked my sin. How many husbands says, she made me do it? I know I yelled at her. I know I hit her. I know I left her. But you know what she'd like to live with. Or vice versa. How many of us blame the other person for something wrong we've done? And it's because we're fretting. We're just getting mad and we're not dealing with it. So that's important. In, in verse 8, he says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. That's the same thing as saying, fret not. So we learn what we're not to do. Thank you, David. Nabal is going to die at our hands. We've learned not what not to do. Well, what are we to do? This psalm, this early part of the psalm, focuses on what we are to do as well as what we're not to do. And this is where it's really good. This is where it's absolutely, practically marvelous. Here is the cure for worry. Here is the cure for fretting. Especially about wicked rich or any other kind of person that's ruining your life and other people's lives. Let's look at it. There's eight of them. I think I've counted right. Number one, trust in the Lord. Verse three. Trust in the Lord. Direct opposite of fretting. It's the same word in Proverbs 31, 11, his heart to safely trust in her. So trust in the Lord. Or Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. This is a great opportunity to activate faith. How are we not going to get heated? especially when someone's taking over good things and ruining good things, trust in the Lord. Our obsession with evil people is not easily broken. It can only be broken by replacing it with something positive. And that's why David says, trust in the Lord. You really got to work on that bataz, Hebrew word, trust in the Lord. Number two, do good. You may not be able to fix them. You may not be able to fix what they're wrecking, but there's always some good to do. And so that's what he says in uh, verse three. Number one, trust in the Lord. Two, do good. How many people were doing good till they got upset and other people were doing evil? And then they stop doing good. <laughs> it's uh, funny. But the Bible says if your enemy is hungry, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Overcome evil with good. We're not in charge of this thing. I hope Athens Bible Church is truer to the Lord after I'm gone than where it is now. I hope the church is blessed. But what if it's ruined? What if it, what if what if it gets overtaken? We don't know. We don't know the future, right? We have responsibilities, 
We, we are to trust in the Lord. This is bigger than us. It's bigger than our church. It's bigger than our family. We trust in the Lord. And we what? We do good. Arno Gabelein said, it's the life of trust and confidence in the Lord which keeps the heart from fretting and being disturbed in the world. Don't let anything stop you from trusting and doing good. It gets discouraging. Ministry gets discouraging. How many people do you know? I've, I've been in four different churches and something bad happened in every one of them. Or maybe more. Well, I've been in quite a few churches too. And something bad happened in every one of them. It's a fallen world. Get used to it. Trust in the Lord and do good. And so instead of giving in to self-pity and hatred, the wise person develops trust in the Lord. And, and Van Gemmeren says, a living faith learns not to take evil so seriously. It seems so powerful, but they're just grass. <laughs> they're just grass. So a living faith learns not to take evil seriously, but commits itself to God's sovereignty, and he knows the times and the season. Pastor Osball, who started this church and trained me, he was working in a factory when he was in Bible college over east. And uh, in the factory, uh, some guy got mad at him for having a Bible study there and witnessing. He said, tomorrow, after work, I'm going to take you out and beat you up. He was one big guy. And uh, everybody in the place was scared of that guy. And so Harlan, he just went home, went to bed, came to work the next day. And everybody heard what he said. He said it in front of everybody. And I said, do you know what happened to so-and-so? No. He died yesterday. Well, he was like grass, wasn't he? God took care of that problem. So you don't know, right? And so you get all bothered about it, wake, stay awake all night about it, and God took care of it. So may God help us to just think about this. And a Jewish writer, not a Christian, said on verse 3, don't be diverted from the path of righteousness because of the temporary advantages which evil offers. And so God... God's the antidote for fretfulness. Trust in him. Do good. Don't envy them. Just leave it in the hands of God. And so forth. Faith, Spurgeon said, faith cures fretting. But I think we need more than just faith. We need doing good. We trust and we do good. Because, okay, bad things are happening. Maybe part of my life work is going under, but there's still good to be done, and I'm going to keep at it. And Spurgeon said, faith has clear optics to behold things as they really are, hence our peace. So very good. Trust in the Lord, number one. Do good, number two. Dwell in the land, number three. Dwell in the land, verse three. Now, you know this, you know your Old Testament Bible. Under Joshua, everybody got the family farm, right? Every family got a piece. And you were to keep that farm in your family, and you were to work that farm. And he's saying, don't leave. Don't leave your land. This is your assignment. This is what you are to do with your daily life. Keep at it. Don't be like Elimelech in the book of Ruth and take off from Moab. You ever wonder what happened when Elimelech left because things were so bad, Boaz stayed and got rich. <laughs> You ever think about that? And so he says, dwell in the land. That's your assignment in life, even though it's a hard assignment at this time. So let God, you keep doing good, dwell in the land. That's, that was the Jew's assignment. This is my part of the theocracy. I'm to live in the land, dwell in the land, 
even though there's evil men. Well, in the land, it's kind of a mantra here. And what's interesting is he's basically saying, don't get off the land to get away from the problem. Just be where you are and serve the Lord where you are. And um, you're going to inherit the land. Verse 9, 11, 18, 22, 27, 29, 34, all says you're going to inherit the land. My personal inclination is that this inheritance is a future life. Because if you look at Psalm 73 and 49, they're explicit, there's explicit reference dealing with the same problem to the future life. And I believe in this Psalm, the reference here is when it talks about inheriting the land, they inherited the land with Joshua and it just passed on. I believe this is a future inheritance that says dwell in the land because you got that inheritance from Joshua in the past and you got another inheritance coming in the future. You don't have to worry if they get ahead of you financially. You're covered. <laughs> You're going to inherit the land. And if I read Ezekiel, they get a lot more land then than they had originally. Dwell in the land. And uh, appreciate it, cherish it, count on it. Be like Naboth. I'm not selling you the land of my fathers. He was loyal to it, right? Cost him his life. First Kings 21, 1 to 3. This has got a history, and it's my responsibility, and I'm sticking with it. Dwell in the land, and you will inherit the land. And understand this. Where God puts me, is no, there's no better place for me to be. And I'm not saying you got to be in the same church or the same city all the time. We know we, we have mobility, right? There's certain mobility in the church. We're not like the Jews, stay in one place. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila are found in two or three different churches, right? So there's, there's a mobility that's legitimate. But if God puts you someplace, you don't want to leave unless God takes you away, right? You just, you you. You, right, I'm on duty. This is my place. And God may move you somewhere else. And that's legitimate if he's leading, because it's a little different in the church. We don't have any land to inherit <laughs> like they did, right, in the theocracy. We get an inheritance, though. W.S. Plummer said, They're here exhorted to bide in their own land and not become dispersed among the surrounding nations inasmuch as God would at home supply their necessary wants. Might be tough. Just hang in there. Well, in the land, or as the old saying is, bloom where you're planted. Now, I've moved several times in my Christian life, in my Christian service. In Indiana, uh, we, we had Columbia City Bible Church. I was at Dover Bible Church. I was here. You know, it's different. But when be sure God leads you someplace, and then just hang in there and be committed. Fourth, it says, dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed. There's a better translation to that. Um, and uh, it, it, it comes out this way, verily you shall be fed. The word is to feed on. And it has the idea of cherish faithfulness and graze on faithfulness. It's like sheep that are grazing on grass. Graze on God's faithfulness. Feed on God's faithfulness. Abel was a feeder of sheep. And the NIV says, enjoy safe pasture. Dwell in the land and enjoy what God gives you. Uh, next. Delight yourself in the Lord. Isn't that the next one? Verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. This is what uh, Derek Kidner calls, calls a deliberate redirection of one's emotions. If you're overoccupied with evil and all the evil and exposing the evil and dealing with the evil and you don't delight yourself in the Lord, you're gonna, it's not going to be healthy for you. You might even be right and wrong. 
Now, we, we need discerning people, don't we? We need ministries that are discerning. We need churches that are discerning. We need pastors that are discerning. We need God's people that are discerning. We need to see it for what it is, but we got to delight in the Lord. we got to be like Barnabas and Saul. We can be chained to a wall in a jail, and we're singing. Uh, this delight yourself in the Lord, the word here is used of a baby at its mother's breast. Isaiah 66, 11. So delighting in the Lord is an important thing. I, I worry about people who can't just enjoy the Lord. I worry about people that read the Bible to, to dispute it or to find something wrong with somebody else or, or even themselves. And they never learn how to just read the Bible to enjoy. The Bible's not, it, that will correct us. It will, it, it will do that, but it, we, we're also to read it just to enjoy the Lord. Raise. <laughs> Raise in the pastures is the idea. So that's kind of important. So it's a deliberate re redirection of one's emotions. And then verse 5 and 6, commit your way to the Lord. And that word commit is roll over. It's, it's, it's a different word. It's the same thing. Uh, it's a very similar to other things he's already said. When he said trust, it's a different Hebrew word. This word is to roll over. It's used of uh, those people are rolling a stone over a well, you just roll it all over to the Lord. Have you ever been trying to lift something too heavy for you and somebody gets on the other end and <laughs> you can kind of give them the weight because you're just about ready to crumble? But this has just roll it over. Just roll it over. What a beautiful picture. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll your way. Roll it all over to the Lord. Then verse 7, well, it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him. That's the word batal, so commit and trust or parallel thoughts. He'll bring it to pass. He'll bring forth your righteousness, light, and your justice as the noon day. He'll, you'll, get justi you'll get justified someday. Next, rest in the Lord. And some translate this in verse 7, resign yourself to the Lord. NIV translates it, be still before the Lord. The word is dhamma. It means to be silent, to be still. It's used of Aaron when he held his peace when his two sons died. It's used in Psalm 4, 4 to 5, and Psalm 131, 2, and some other wonderful places. He's in Exodus 15, 16, still as a stone. <laughs> be still. Finally, wait patiently for him. Be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him. Fret not because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings evil to pass. Wait patiently for him. Uh, this waiting patiently is an interesting thing. It kind of indicates a painful waiting, a waiting that's hard to do. It's a hith poel, poel imperative, and it ac actually has this idea of painful waiting. If, I, if I've read the parallel verses of words on this, it's kind of a situation where it's hard to wait, but we wait anyway. Have you ever trained a dog to sit? Or stay? You know what I'm talking about? He's doing it. But there's some point where it gets hard. <laughs> it starts wiggling a little bit, and, uh, and the waiting becomes almost unbearable. And, but he's he's learning to stay, and we need to wait patiently for him. That's what this is talking about. Put that picture in your mind. Okay, I'm in this situation. I don't like it. I don't want to be here. But I'm to rest in the Lord. I'm to roll it over in the Lord, and I'm to be like that dog sitting and waiting patiently for him. Fret not yourself because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings 
evil devices to pass. Cease from anger. That's the other negative that's very parallel to fret. Don't fret. Sake wrath. Fret not yourself in the way. For evil duels will be cut off, and those that wait on the Lord will inherit the earth. By the way, Jesus got the meek will inherit the earth from that verse. For yet a little while, and the wicked will not be. Yea, they'll, you shall diligently consider his place, and they shall not be. But the meek will inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Very fascinating, wonderful verse. The plots and plans of the wicked rich are multiple. And, but those plots and plans and successful plots and plans look very shabby to King David. And it's the same today. The Lord Jesus would help us this Passion Week. Think about what, how Caiaphas and Pilate and Sanhedrin looked after the tomb was empty. Yeah, they succeeded for a while. Think about how all these people that look like they're so successful in unbelief and disobedience and rebellion are going to look when Jesus comes. What's their life going to look like? It's going to look like a wasted, totally wasted, stupid, foolish life. We should pity them, not envy them. Spurgeon said, great numbers of persons have no concern about their souls. They care more about cats and dogs than about their souls. And there's people that care more about the stock market than their souls or their position in society than their souls. They're to be pitied. They have inverted values. And someone said, in a society that has you counting your money, your calories, your pounds, and your steps, <laughs> count your blessings instead. <laughs> you, people got these counters, everything. You count your steps. Count your, I even got one that broke twice and I forgot. I got rid of it. Broke by, it broke twice before I ever got, off, got anything out of it. It's a sad thing. There's, it's no good to know how to count unless you know what to count and what counts. <laughs> it's amazing. Now there's 29 more verses in this psalm. I hope that this has been an interesting introduction to it. And I hope that you look at it with anticipation next week. Um, we're going to be joint heirs with Christ. We got everything. If our life in this world is pretty hard, that's okay. One more illustration and I'm done. When I was a student at OU, I lived in the Convocation Center the first year it opened. And there was a fellow that lived there that I've, I think I've used this before. He looked exactly like Omar Sharif. We called him Omar. That was his nickname. He was the handball champion of OU. And he gambled. And he was so good, he would spot anybody 20 points and put money on the game and let you serve. Now, if you know anything about handball, I used to play handball. I think it was either racquetball or handball. I can't remember which one. I used to play both. 21, you win. But you got to serve to get your point. He would spot you 20 points and let you serve and put money on the game. He was that. He didn't have to know how good you were or how good you weren't. And he was winning all the time. He was that good. Now, what's going on with the wicked rich? God's spotting them 20 points. <laughs> and he's going to make them. They're going to lose. So feel bad for them. Feel bad for them. Yeah, they have this success, that success, that success. But it's not going to last, and it's not going to be permanent. They can't outwit God. They can't out fight God. He that sits in the heavens will laugh.
And not because it's funny, but because it's impossible. So may God help us as we move through this psalm later. We're going to look through different things that he says and then kind of look at the whole thing. Remember, it's not an art, a sustained argument. It's more proverbial. But I believe that these psalms helped me as a young person. It kind of helped me redirect my heart. Helped me redirect my heart about what I wanted my life to be and how I define success. And a willingness not to be important down here even if I had it. There's a lot of good stuff here. I hope this is helpful to you. And may God bless it to our lives. Father, we thank you for what you uh, have for us in this psalm. Challenge us in the next time we look at it. May we may it accomplish its work in our lives. May, may one or two of these verses stick with us so that we can carry them with us in temptation and be successful in thwarting it. When we have decisions to make or when we're in, the, in a situation where this fretting is going on, help us, Lord, to pull out Psalm 37 and utilize it. In Jesus' name, amen.